Okay, we've been uh, in a series called Flesh, and we've already talked about this a little bit today, but it is a series that talks about what it means <clears throat> for us to be the flesh of Jesus to the world. Jesus came in the flesh as, a, as spirit. He took on meat and bones and skin. He became flesh to the world to represent God. And like him, we are supposed to take on the, the blood, uh, the, the bones, the meat, the skin of Jesus so we can represent Jesus to the world. So we are both being incarnated, if you will. And uh, <clears throat> so we have five steps we've been kind of tracking and uh, the first one is incarnation. And that's exactly what I just said. That's being the incarnate Jesus to the world. Being the hands and feet of Jesus to the world. So that means we're going to say the things Jesus said. We're going to do the things Jesus did. And we're going well, we're gonna to act like Jesus. That's where that question comes in. You remember the bracelets and WWJD, what would Jesus do? This is incarnation. This is us being Jesus a Jesus representative, a little Jesus to the world around us. And then last week, we talked about reputation. And we looked at the life of Jesus, and he was a friend of sinners. And he hung out with tax collectors and thieves and prostitutes. Any of you hanging out with tax collectors, thieves, and prostitutes? I don't really hang out with those people. <laughs> okay, if you, maybe if you're in high school, you, you might <laughs> hang out with something similar. Uh <clears throat> Or college. I don't hang out with those kind of people, but Jesus did. And he had a good reputation among those people. They loved him. They hung on every word. They followed him around. He chose them. He chose some very unlikely people to be his apostles, didn't he? He chose them. Come and follow me. And they left everything because of the reputation of Jesus. We also talked about last week that with the religious people, Jesus didn't have that great of a reputation, right? They tried to kill him. In fact, they did kill him. They were always plotting against him. So with the religious people who were more concerned about keeping the religious laws than about loving people, man, he was all on, on them, and he had a not-so-great reputation with them. But overall, for non-believers or sinners, Jesus had a good reputation, and we too can develop a good reputation among unbelievers. People who don't know Jesus, people who don't follow Jesus. We can develop a great reputation with those people by living an incarnational life, being the hands and feet of Jesus. There's three more, conversation, confrontation, and transformation. Today we're going to talk about conversation and confrontation now <clears throat> for i think for most of us these are the hardest two in these five steps a lot of us are not confrontational people at all i tend to be a confrontational people person uh, <laughs> no you're not yes you are uh i tend to be confrontational with with people but not when it comes to to teaching about Jesus to someone who doesn't believe. I shy away from confrontation when it comes to talking about Jesus with unbelievers. And I certainly shy away from confronting them with the truth. Now, Jesus came full of grace and truth. And I think that's the key to learn how to do these two things well, is always be full of grace and truth. We know what the Great Commission is. Je this is Jesus' command, right, in Matthew. He said, Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We know that. And we know we should be teaching. We should be baptizing we should be making disciples and teaching people about jesus that's what we should be doing but if you're anything like me this brings me guilt 
I feel guilty sometimes when I read this, especially when a preacher preaches on it. I feel guilty. I'm not doing that very much with non-believers. Are you? And there's this tension when we talk about doing evangelism. There's this tension about we don't want to be too pushy with people, right? That We don't like that at all. But we also don't want to be a pushover. We don't want to be coercive and trap people to talk about Jesus, but we don't want to be too quiet. We don't want to be too bold and brash when we talk about our faith, but we don't want to be hush-hush either. And there's this tension here. Do you feel the tension when we talk about evangelism? You know you ought to, right? But when we don't, the Great Commission becomes the Great Omission. We fail to do it. There's a lot of shame involved. There's a lot of guilt. Those of us who are, I should say, those of you who are introverts, you really get nervous when people start talking about evangelism, don't you? Whether it's the preacher, whether it's in your growth group lesson, and there's a discussion question about getting out of your comfort zone and telling someone about Jesus you probably start getting sweaty. Your hands get sweaty. You, you need an excuse to leave the room. It just doesn't. It's not your cup of tea. Ex- extroverts like me may not react the same way, but I do react to it because I'm guilty of the great omission. And I feel the tension between these two things. I know what I should do, but I know what I'm not doing. I want to obey Jesus. I want to follow him. So... I took matters into my own hands a few years ago. In the 1990s, I decided I needed to be trained in how to do evangelism. So some folks from the church I was at, we went to an evangelism explosion seminar. You ever heard of evangelism explosion? It was big time. It was started in a church down in uh, Florida. I bet you've heard of... uh, D. James Kennedy, he has a radio program as a Presbyterian church in Florida. He's a big name in the Christian world. He's it started at his church. Well, Evangelism Explosion was a way to train lay people and ministers to witness to non-Christians. And what we did, we went every week to this church, and a speaker would speak about 30 or 40 minutes, and then we would go over the homework that we did the week before. And the homework was memorizing scripture and memorizing kind of a formula, if you will, of how to present the gospel. And it's based on two diagnostic questions. The first question you would ask somebody is this. If you were to die, you've heard this question, haven't you? If you were to die tonight, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven? If the person said, I don't know, maybe, I wish, I hope so, the next question is, Would you like to know tonight? If they said no, you said, okay, bless you. If they said yes, you proceeded to go down a memorized track. That's the first diagnostic question, if you were to die tonight. The second diagnostic question was, when you approach, so if they said yes, I'm going to heaven. So the second question is, when you approach the pearly gates and God asks you, why should I let you in? What's going to be your answer? Well, if they answered anything that has to do with, uh, I'm a good person, I'm not a bad person, I do more good than bad in my life, I think if they say anything like that, then you go down another path to talk about how you can't earn your way into heaven. This all makes sense so far, right? It's all factual. It's all true. If they said, yes... I know that I would tell God, the reason you should let me into heaven is because of Jesus. Because the blood of Jesus. I don't deserve it. It is His grace. Then you bless that person. And you, you acknowledge them as a fellow believer. Pray with them and send them on your way. Okay? That's a little summary. So after our hearing the speaker and going over our homework, our memorization, we would go out in threes. It would be one experienced EE, that's evangelism explosion, EE person with two novices. 
So my mentor would take me and somebody else, and we went to the mall in Nashville. It was the Hundred Oaks Mall, if you know where that is. And so we just kind of tagged along this guy, right, behind him, and he would just go up to total strangers and say, can I ask you a question? If you were to die tonight, he would do the whole thing. He had it. He was smooth, man. He had it memorized and polished. And people were, every time, they were like taken aback, right? It's, oh, whoa, 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 what? I mean, you're used to in the mall, those people with the vests and the clipboards coming up to you saying, would you like to take a survey? You know, and you're used to that. You can see them coming, right? You can kind of avoid them and go in the store or whatever. But we were just walking around the mall. So you, you corner these people and you ask them the questions and you go down this track or this track or this track, depending on how they answer. People were shocked. I was very uncomfortable watching this happen. I was supposed to be learning how to do it. And I was also embarrassed that this is how people, how we're presenting Jesus to people. I was embarrassed. And it just didn't feel right to me at all. Now, I needed the training. I needed the memorization. I needed the skills to talk to people about Jesus. This is not the way to do it. This is not the way to have conversation with people about Jesus and confrontation about Jesus. It was very confrontational. Now, EE, according to the website, says that 2 million people professed Christ last year alone in 212 companies, uh, countries through EE. 2 million people in 212 companies came to know Christ. So it's obviously working for somebody. All right. My question is, who's it working for? Because it didn't work for me. He just made me feel more uncomfortable and more withdrawn into my shell. I know that's hard to believe. <clears throat> but it happened. Well, I think that the Apostle Paul can help us with this tension. This tension between knowing what we should do and not knowing how to do it or not feeling comfortable to talking to people about Jesus. So if you want to turn your Bibles, it's going to be up here on the uh, screen. But it's going to be from <clears throat> Colossians chapter 4. This is Paul talking. He's writing a letter to a church in Colossae, which is in modern-day Turkey. Okay, if you're, if you're Christians, you know this, what I'm about to say. But if you're a new Christian or not a Christian yet, you probably don't aren't up to date or caught up. So let me catch us all up to the same place, okay? Paul, who's writing this letter, used to be Saul. Saul was a hater. He was a Christian hater. In fact, he hated Christians so much and thought they were going against God's will, he arrested Christians. He would go around raiding houses and throwing people in prison because they believed in Jesus. He even oversaw people's murder, being stoned to death, because they believed in Jesus. And this same Saul was on his way to, do, to continue what he w wanted to do. And <clears throat> Jesus met him on the road. In a bright light from heaven shone down. Why are you persecuting me? I am Jesus. I am God. And so Paul was blinded. He, he realized, I've, I got this thing wrong. Jesus is God. And he changed his whole life around. He started preaching everywhere and starting churches and, and telling people about Jesus. That's who this Paul is, okay? So many years later, Paul is in house arrest in Rome. He's in chains. And he's writing this letter to a church in Colossae. And this is what he tells them. Devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message. So that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in, what? Chains. Pray that I might, what? Proclaim it clearly, as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. I think in these verses... 
Paul is going to help us out with the tension in the room about evangelism. Okay? You know, there are different spiritual gifts. Some people have the gift of administration. Some people have the gift of teaching. Some have the gift of prophecy. Some have the gift of evangelism. And some of us don't have the gift of evangelism, but we're going to have different gifts. I don't know how many people in here think you have the gift of evangelism. I hope, you, I hope there are some in here who feel that way. That is not my highest gift. My gift of leadership and teaching is much higher than my gift of evangelism. Maybe that's why I feel some tension between this commandment and what I'm actually doing or what I feel comfortable doing. So I think we find two, I'm going to call them classes of evangelists here in this scripture. I don't really like that word, but it's the best I can come up with right now. Two classes. I think you have the gifted evangelist, which would be Paul and the people with him. And then you have the everyday evangelist. And he gives them specific instructions here. Let's look at first what he says to the um, gifted evangelist. He says, he tells them to pray for God. Here's what he wants them to pray about. Pray that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ. That I may proclaim it clearly as I should. That is the role of a gifted evangelist. One who has the spiritual gift of evangelism. To proclaim boldly. To always be looking for open doors. To speak the words. A gifted evangelist. But the everyday evangelist also has kind of a job description here. Look at the blue here. What are they supposed to do? They're supposed to devote themselves to prayer, be watchful and thankful, and pray for the gifted evangelists. They need to be wise in how they act toward outsiders, read outsiders as unbelievers, people who do not follow Jesus. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Now, why is that the job description of an everyday evangelist? What does praying, being watchful and thankful, being wise, what does this have to do with evangelism? Yeah, I don't know if you heard or not, but I'm finished with my sermon now. Eric just wrapped it up for me. The everyday evangelist does everyday stuff, right? But on purpose. They do it on purpose. They are looking. They're being watchful for opportunities. And they want to make the most of those opportunities. But I think, like Eric said, this is everyday stuff. It is living an incarnational life. It's living a life where it makes people wonder, what the heck are these people up to? Why is he so kind and generous? Why is he so quick to forgive? I've never seen that before. Why Why is that marriage... I've just never seen a husband and wife treat each other so lovingly and take care of each other. What is it with you people? The last line, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Why must you know how to answer everyone? Because these people are asking questions. Because you, get this, you are living a questionable life. We are called to live questionable lives. Lives that make people... Perk up and say, this guy's different. She's different. They, that group of people are different. And they're going to ask, why? If you're in their life, and like Eric said again, being in relationships and doing everyday stuff with people, and you're growing, you're being watchful, you're being wise, you're praying, <clears throat> you're making the most of every opportunity, they are going to ask you questions. When they see you loving like nobody else, giving and being generous like nobody else. And forgiving and treating your people under you at work. 
and how you talk about your boss at work, how at school you choose not to participate in certain activities, how when you're dating life, you want to be pure and holy and you draw boundaries. The people you're with are going, what? Are you living in the 18th century? Are you a pilgrim? Are you a Puritan? People will ask questions. Why do you live like this? How do you do it? Live questionable lives. That is really what we're talking about when we talk about conversation. When you are close to someone and you have a friendship with someone, you can talk as friends talk. Friends talk, right? Friends talk to each other. They talk about real things. And if Jesus is real in your life and you're living it out like nobody else... They're going to ask you questions, and you're going to be ready to answer people. Even if they call you, you got to be ready. See how quick he grabbed that phone? He was ready to answer. You better get that. That might be the Lord sending somebody your way right now. Yeah. Now, Paul's not the only one who had this idea in the New Testament that we should live questionable lives. Peter had the same idea. And he said in 1 Peter 1, 15, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who, what? Asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Same idea. Live a questionable life. So that when people ask you, why do you live this way? Why do you make these choices? How in the world are you always, you seem like you're always full of joy. How is that possible? How how are you and your wife, how have y'all been married, Danny, for 50 years? Is it 50? 51 years. That's unusual. That's crazy. In today's society. Or half the couple's divorce, right? Live questionable lives. Peter and Paul agree. The gifted evangelist's responsibility is to proclaim boldly. The everyday evangelist, it's our, and I put myself in this category, It's mine and your responsibility to provide clear answers when people ask questions. Because we're living questionable lives. But, if we vacation like everybody else, if we are materialistic like everybody else, if we spend money the same way as everybody else, if we use the same language as everybody else, if if Christians had the same divorce rate as everybody else, then we are not living questionable lives. We're living like everybody else. How much difference is there between our life and how we're living, how we're being Jesus to the world? How much difference is there between us and non-believers? If there's not much difference, then we're not living questionable lives. Last week, Mark talked about the Roman Empire... And how in the second century, the Christians turned the thing upside down. They were this nobody class. They were peons, and they didn't have... They were even called pagans by the Roman government. And Emperor Julian sent down an edict saying, these Christians are growing, they're becoming more and more numerous, and it's because they are loving people. They're, they're being with the sick and caring for the sick and the dying. They're taking care of their widows and their orphans. They are being extraordinary in their love. They are out-loving us. So he says, let's out-love them. And we'll show them who really knows how to love and take care of it. Of course, it didn't work. Christians just kept going, going, going. And it multiplied and it rocked the whole world. Because they were living incarnationally. And they were gaining a good reputation among the unbelievers. They were living questionable lives. Well, questionable lives lead us uh, to a time, will lead us to a time when words 
will be necessary. But the difference is, when we live a questionable life, we're building relationships, we are really with people, and those words are going to be spoken naturally in a friendship conversation. Are you with me? If you're friends with someone, you're going to talk about deep things. And they're going to question you. Why do you do this? Why do you believe this? It's the perfect opportunity to have a heart-to-heart talk and just explain. And ask, you should ask questions yourselves of them. <clears throat> so if we let grace just ooze out of our life, then people will eventually seek the truth. They want to know the truth. This is what Jesus did. Jesus, Jesus confronted the religious people. But Jesus hardly ever confronted a non-religious person, a pagan, a sinner, a tax collector. There wasn't the same, conf- at least it wasn't the same kind of confrontation, right? Now, this word confrontation probably raises some of your temperature up. It makes you a little bit nervous about what I'm going to say, about confronting someone. Let me help you relax. It is not your job to confront an unbeliever about their lack of faith. It is our job to confront one another as Christians and say, hey, I see you're messing up here. I see you're not living the way you should. That is our job. We're supposed to judge each other's fruit. But people outside the church, unbelievers, we, we're not supposed to judge their fruit. Jesus did not come to condemn and judge. He came to save. So confrontation is not us confronting unbelievers. Confrontation is the Spirit's job, not our job. Jesus said this in John chapter 16. He says, it's the Spirit's job, and here's the quote, to prove the world wrong about sin, about righteousness, and about judgment. Whose job is it? It's the Spirit. It's not your job, my job, to convict the world about sin and righteousness and judgment. That's the Spirit's job. So relax. I'm not asking us to go confront anybody like I did in the mall back in Nashville several years ago. Let the Spirit do it. Because Jesus didn't confront unbelievers that way. This is really handy for people who are everyday evangelists, everyday Christians. Gifted evangelists, you may take on more of a confrontational role if you need to. I don't think it works. I was down on Bill Street several years ago, and there was an old-timey street preacher down there with a placard sandwich sign, you know, and said something like, I mean, this is a caricature, but it said something like, the end is near, repent. And he had a megaphone. And he's at Bill Street, and there's lots of tourists. This is during the day. Lots of people walk around. And he's just yelling at people the whole time. And I don't think that's a very healthy way of confronting people and having a conversation with people. You probably don't either. And we want to stay away from that. We want to, we're afraid of that. So we're not even going anywhere near that today in our conversation. <clears throat> so people like the woman caught in adultery. Jesus didn't condemn her. He forgave her. He gave her grace. Tax collectors like Matthew and Zacchaeus, he ate with them and all their sinner friends. Prostitutes, he ate with them. He loved on them. He gave them grace. There wasn't confrontation. There was conversation. It's the Spirit's job to confront. It's our job to live questionable lives and have conversations with people. So, in light of all that, what does this have to do with us? How is your day going to be different tomorrow at school or or work or in your home? What does this look like at your house, at your work, and at your school? Well, let's just examine that a little bit. Let's ask ourselves a few questions. Question one, how many friends do I have who are not believers? 
that might be the perfect place to start. Because if you're like me, you live in a Christian bubble. And in my Christian bubble, I'm surrounded by Christians. I work with Christians. I spend time with Christians. I have Christians in my home. I go to their home. We go canoeing together. We do all service projects together. It's all Christians all the time in my safe little Christian bubble. And I had hard, hardly any non-believing friends, unbelieving friends. What about you? Maybe we just simply need to start by being friends and making new friends and nothing else. Make friends. Develop a trusted relationship. And as you do life together and live a questionable life, the Spirit will convict them. And they will ask questions of you and you can have conversations. How can you make the most of opportunity every day around non-believers? What can you do to increase the opportunity at, say, your kid's ball practice? There's a bunch of people, parents sitting in the stands. A lot of them are just kind of looking at the phones and texting. What can you do to make the most of that opportunity to make new friends, to start conversations? It doesn't have to be about Jesus. It's just friends. What can you do to redeem your hobbies, your relationship with your clients that you visit or that come to visit you? In your school lunchroom is a great place. To make the best opportunity, make the best of the opportunities, because there's lots of opportunities in the school lunchroom. How will you treat your waiter, your server today when you go to lunch? Your food is cold, it's the wrong order, and it took too long to get to you. How are you going to treat them? With grace, dignity, or confrontation? I'm, I'm preaching to myself right now pretty hard. This is real stuff. When's the last time you invited a neighbor to your house for supper? Just come eat with us. Sit at table with us. Barriers are broken when people eat together. Now, I'm not saying I have this all down. Okay? But I want to tell you a short little story. I have a friend who is not a Christian. Actually, I wouldn't call him a friend yet. I think I'd call him an acquaintance. And this acquaintance of mine is a very polite person. He is very friendly. He's very servant-minded. He um, is not a Christian. He doesn't believe the same things I believe. In fact, he believes some things that are very different than I believe about who God is and how God operates. Because I have been convicted, the Spirit has confronted me that I need to get out of my Christian bubble and meet new people. I felt drawn to this guy. And I just want to be a friend with him. I like him. I like him a lot. With that in mind, I went up to him the other day and said, Hey, can I buy you lunch sometime? And his answer was, does this have anything to do with witnessing? Now, immediately that told me two things. Number one, it told me, I have not earned the right to talk about Jesus with him. Because I'm not a friend yet. I'm an acquaintance. Number two, this guy has been hurt by Christians. He never told me those things, but I know it's true. So my answer was, and I can say this in all honesty, because I was wanting to be friends. That's, that was my, my sole purpose. I just felt drawn to him. Was, uh, you know what, I just want to know about you and what you believe. He said, okay. <laughs> Total change of attitude. What are we doing as Christians? He knows I'm a Jesus follower. What are we doing wrong that makes people put up a wall immediately? What have we done? Folks, we need to repent. The Christian world needs to repent 
for putting up walls between unbelievers and Jesus. And we are guilty. We're guilty of judging them and they feel it. We're guilty of avoiding them and living in our Christian bubble. It reminds me of a bumper sticker that says, Lord, please save us from your followers. There's actually a documentary that came out about that called the same thing. Lord, please save us from your followers. I don't think unbelievers will feel this way if we truly lived questionable lives. I believe we knock all the barriers down, or most of them. Put, take all the walls down by living like Jesus. Being friends with sinners, unbelievers, drug addicts, unwed mothers. Just keep going down the list of people who are either unbelievers or maybe they're on the, marginal, on, of, on the margins of society. We be like Jesus. We live like Jesus. We speak like Jesus. We do the things that Jesus did. We build a good reputation. And conversation will flow because we're living questionable lives. And eventually, the Spirit will convict them. My main point is this. Live a questionable life. That's the one thing I'm asking you to do. Is live a questionable life. A questionable life is one that's filled with grace. A questionable life leads to a good reputation. A questionable life will break down walls. Imagine the difference it would make in our spiritual lives if we gained a good reputation among non-Christians. And as people living out the incarnation of Jesus, living questionable lives, we are loving deeply we're forgiving quickly. We're giving sacrificially. We are generous in our hospitality. We eat and play and hang out with people just because we love them. Imagine what it would be like if our church was filled with that kind of people. Imagine what this church's reputation would be in the city. Imagine if we were more like the Scott family. I can't think of a better example in our church of people who live questionable lives. Now, I question a lot of things the Scott boys do. <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. The Scott family lives a questionable life in their neighborhood. You know what? There's proof in this room today. Bam. J.D. J.D. was a neighbor. And the Scots lived a questionable life. And they invited neighbors into the home all the time, and they still do. Stacy feeds everybody. I don't know how, where she finds all the food in her pantry. She's always feeding people. David is always serving people and doing things for families. It's a safe place. They have kids dropping in all the time who are in trouble in their neighborhood. They need somebody to talk to. They need some help with this or that. The Scots live questionable lives. J.D. has given his life to Jesus because of this, partly because the Scots live that questionable life. He's maturing right now as a Christian young man partly because the Scots live a questionable life. Imagine what it would be like if we all lived that kind of questionable lives. I'm excited about this. The word about Jesus would get out. And we would build street cred. We would build a good reputation because we're being like Jesus. This isn't, is this too difficult to talk about and do, to live a questionable life? I mean, I think we can do this. I think we can start small even. Find one way this week where you can start living a questionable life with a non-believer. Build a relationship with them. We can do this. 
And if you today want to pray about this or pray about anything else, our shepherds are going to be in the back of the room right now. We're going to stand and sing a song. They're going to be back there. I invite you to go back there and pray with them. It could be about anything. It doesn't have to be about this topic. If you want to know more about how to become a Christian, come on back there and say, hey, I'm interested. What do I need to do next? So let's stand and sing this next song and invite you to come to the back.